Hello and welcome to YouTube's favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. I want to remind everybody that we do have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon now. There are three different levels that will get you access to our videos first to give you a leg up on the Kayfabe effect. And if you choose the King Kayfaber level, you get access to all the videos early, as well as the recording session, where you can really get out ahead of the Kayfabe effect. But you can also sit in on these recording sessions and uh, contribute to the conversation that we're having. We appreciate that. So check it out. See what level fits you best. I also want to remind everybody of Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July. The last Saturday in July, we're asking our audience to pull out some of their comics, doubles, comps, uh, just books that they think are great introductions to comics and insert them into your local lending library. Uh, we have a lot of those around the country and we did it last year. Take pictures of those little local lending libraries with the comics shining through the windows. Those things are uh, very photogenic. We saw thousands of pictures on social media last year. We want to do even better this year. Let's try to grow some new comic book readers by putting some good comics out there where we know readers are looking. So today we are going to look at one of my favorite books. Dean Mullaney has been reprinting comics and comic strip art for a long time. This is Kniff, a visual biography. Milton Kniff, one of the most influential, most widely read comic book or cartoonists in history. Uh, not comic books per se, but comic strips. And this is an amazing book. Anybody that is unfamiliar with this one, it really is a biography. Mulaney's good at putting together these books of, you know, overviews and histories of everyone. A lot of this stuff is coming out of the Billy Island, and it is just a fantastic way to get introduced to Milk Kniff's work. It's a big body of work. This is a monograph, and we're going to kind of go through it quickly as a result because there's so much here to cover. Yes, we Starting get, with a foreword by Lucy Shelton Caswell, who was the founder of the Billy Ireland, uh, the great comics museum at Ohio State. Worth mentioning because Billy Ireland was a guy who Kniff worked under. So, you know, his mentor gets a library named after it. Kniff's support of that library certainly helped that library grow and continue into one of the great comic destinations on Earth. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much was the Milk Kniff archive to start, you know? Like, this guy has been making comic strips from... First published work, 1920, out of Dayton News. There it is, man. So, like, if Terry and the Pirates is the first, like, I think it's 1931, to about 1988, every single day, uh, like, from, from that whole period, that's a lot of pages. Yeah, and sometimes twice a day, because there are multiple strips that he would run uh, in some places and not others... During World War II, he did a couple of years of a second daily strip with Mel Call. So I'm doing a daily myself, dude, and I'm really deep down that rabbit hole reading a lot of these books and things. Uh, uh, you know, the, all the great collections have good front and back matter. Pittsburgh. That's fine. A Boy, Boy Scout piece that he supported. He was a Boy Scout. Boy Scout comics he did as a very, very young man. That's so dope. So uh, I want to ask you, man, like, because, like, the comic strip guys are just, they're more sophisticated. Like, like the comic book people were the proletarians, man. Like, it was it was just regular-ass folk, and, and they were churning out pages to just pay for the, the their utilities and shit like that. But I've been discovering that the comic strip guys are, like, waspy, like, rich kids and shit. They, uh, they all got to go to college, and, like, that's the dividing line, right? Because, like, Great Depression, all of that stuff, like, none of, nine, none of my four grandparents finished high school. Because they had to, like, go off and work. And uh, do you know about, like, his, his upbringing? Is, is he a little rich kid? Not a rich kid. Had to work his way through college. And uh, that was a Billy Ireland was instrumental in that. I see. You know, he, he was working a lot. He had stuff that he was doing for Ohio State. Um, he was interested in theater, so he's doing advertising for a theater. Yeah. He was performing in theater, but he was also doing commercial art and working for the uh, actual newspaper under Billy Ireland. Yeah, man. And in the Ohio State Phoenix, this is where Jeff Smith's thorn would be serialized. What a legacy. Four, four decades later. Yeah, incredible. This is uh, this is kind of funny, this sundial. This is uh, him reflecting on uh, his experience. And former sundial artist reviews his college memories. It's all just beautiful women <laughs> surrounding him at his drawing table. Like, what's this? What's a sundial? A, a... I think that was a college... Um, the Campus Humor magazine. So in addition to like the school newspaper, you know, he is working a lot and some of it for money out of necessity. 1927 oil painting. This this book is so fantastic because uh, I think Caswell in the intro talks about how she's a pack rat and his wife was a pack rat. And so 
we benefit from that because all of this stuff exists and it's on record. Like you can go there and check this stuff out in person. Most of the work that's in this book. Yeah. What you need are the historians who are willing to compile it and put it together. Uh, like Dean Mullaney, you know, like Jeet here, who we hear from quite a bit on the comics history stuff and, and does his own digging in various schools. It's fascinating what's out there and what we have a record of. Um, whenever he first goes to, I believe it's New York, um, because he goes a couple of times before he's there full time. His wife, called her Bunny, would send home almost daily correspondence in the form of comic strips. Yeah, like he's fun. writing letters. This is those letters. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, it, like it's it just speaks to the compulsion and just working on a daily strip. I see how it works. Like I see the mania of it because it's literally Sisyphus. Like it's this never ending thing that you're going to be doing forever. And, like if you're doing well at a strip you'll be doing it forever. So there's never an end to it. And you get to just indulge in compulsive comic making. And for certain of us, myself included, that is a fun place to be. This was his tryout uh, attempt to get hired at the uh, Dispatch, the Columbus newspaper. And that is Billy Ireland that he's writing to. And Billy Ireland was like, you got to wow us with your application. So he makes this whole comic strip as, uh, you know, kind of a promo of himself and, you know, optimistic here at the end that he's impressing Billy Ireland, but he did. He got the job working nights on the newspaper to pay pay for college. I love it because this is that like Landon school of cartooning, which is indicative of like the oldest of like Disney animations and stuff. It's hard to explain exactly what that stuff looked like, but like hands would be a circle template with like little sausages coming out. The cartoony face was like a distilled down version of like the cartoony stuff in uh in in the sh comic strips and this kind of bold lettering is very indicative very like um art deco style hand lettering that'd be right because he's there from uh, 1925 to the early 1930s like the depression cutbacks are what lead to him losing that job and uh man this book is really great in that all these ca everything is annotated so you know you can follow along with any of this stuff but you see like when he's working on the newspaper by the way hand lettering yeah Hand lettering, man, this stuff, I had to stare at it and be like, damn, you know, because you see the little bits of white out that they would do for edges. You'll still see Chris Ware do that absolutely, sometimes, absolutely. you know, give that sharp edge to those lines. Um, but what it prepares him for is working with different materials and just like whatever is needed. You know, that's essentially what his job was at this newspaper. So you would get advertising, you would get movie reviews, caricatures, just everything. And pretty good training for a young artist who wants to work in newspapers. So at uh, the Billy Ireland, I, of course, I pulled a lot of Kniff while, while I was there. Like, I did a residency out there, man, and it was a three-week residency. And I put seven of those days. I put 33% of my time at Billy Ireland from opening till close. And stuff like this. So this blue wash, this would be an indicator to um because this would be on like some terry and the pirates and things this would be an indicator to the printer engraver to put like a gray tone so it's almost like they do the zip but it's not as it's not really a zip but it is gray that is dots it's a different kind of mm -hmm. it, think think of the margins of like cracked or mad magazine where it's like that smooth gray where it's clearly not like right just dots that you apply that way there's some other process to denote that and i think that's what this is but uh the no sickles work would have this kind of shit also and he's another Ohio, like those guys. Oh, yeah. These guys, they shared offices and uh, some some work and, and all this stuff. How fun are these things, like seeing him do kind of pop culture, you know, Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. And like I said, early on, he was into the uh, Coke Hill. Yeah, oh, yeah. He yeah. was into uh, theater. That was his other passion. And Billy Ireland said, you know, actors don't always eat. Stick to the art. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is, because I feel like my how things have changed, but uh, probably acting still not a very solid, dependable profession. The format of these strips is interesting, like a real Rube Goldberg or um, the Ripley's Believe It or Not, which started as a strip kind of formatted in the same way. It's amazing when you see these because like they're not necessarily appearing on the comics page. You yeah. know, like these comics might appear in different sections of the newspaper even. Yeah, just like little ads for, for stuff. But uh, you do get to see like some of his early... You know, he'll he'll get to do a strip regularly. You know, something like Escape, Escape from the Pen was one of the early strips that he got to do. They, so he's working th towards yeah. the comic strip. And but you take what you can get in the beginning. And it's dope because even um, 
Ter when Terry and the Pirates starts, it's about at that level. So I hope they have like, you know, the first Sunday in here or something. Look at how impressive this is for a comic strip like this. He's breaking borders down. He's doing like long shots, different angles. It's amazing. They talk about like whenever the first sound movies came out, you know, yeah. it was about whenever he's getting active in this stuff. By the way, here's a Billy Ireland sample of a of a comic that Billy Ireland did for throughout his life. But to give you again, like the rigor of that Midwest style and what Kniff is learning under. I mean, this is another one where you start looking at it and breaking it down and unbelievable. This is what you're putting on a page. Jimmy, I'm embarrassed that I never even thought to look at Billy Ireland's work or stu study that cartoonist at all. But what I was saying is like once, once, you know, a little bit of cinema enters, yeah. a lot of filmmakers credit Kniff with coming up with a lot of their camera setups that's, and things. That's fascinating, man, be because like you could clearly see like when, once the talkies are a thing, this is comic strip art changes. Travel journals. So like London, Japan, once he starts traveling, he keeps these kinds of records and drawings. Just phenomenal, man. You're like he, the guy drawing all the time, right? Totally. And, and and I think you have to have that sword sharpened to like be at that level. But like, look at even the lettering, man. You know, you know, in a travel journal, he's not Ames guiding it, so yeah. like his hand is steady as fuck, just naturally. Yeah, totally. And you know, kind of that classic kind of cartooning. You know, something that you would see in Mad Magazine, and we would get all excited over. You know, Kurtzman just loading up like gags, or Will Elder loading up these pages. Can Kniff can, can do, do everything. Yeah, he can do it too. All right, man, here we go. No sickles. You mentioned him. Uh, one, of, one of the guys that really stands out to me from this era, and they worked in the same studios together for, for several years. Uh, I can't remember which one went to New York first, but they worked together in the newspapers there. A lot of history together and a lot of influence, I think, on each other when they're, when they're getting into their early days of comic strip making. These are fantastic, like spot illustrations that they're doing from the Associated Press. Uh, this is the same deal, you know, like, an editor or publisher is going to need a, a piece and it was just like send it into the bullpen there man incredible artist like these guys from that associated press bullpen would be called up to to like ghost strips for artists for various reasons like they were just jacks of all trade and you can see it as you flip through here just the variety of styles fashion is something that he's credited with dress is actually made up after his designs That's and some right. of the illustrations. And I think we'll see photos of some of that stuff later on. Gotta love this. Ruffs that he submitted. I don't think any of these were purchased, but you can see even on top of like a full workload, he's still constantly churning out material, trying yeah. to get to that next that next level. That's what you gotta do, man. There's always somebody working harder than you. How much Will Eisner is in this image? Right? I would be shocked. Like, like I mean, it's, it's Eisner. Yeah, incredible. Absolutely. But all kinds of variety of stuff. Attention to light, which we would see characterize his work. One of the giant influences of his, I think, is that attention to light sources. Man, and just these giant brush strokes, which again, we're going to see, you know, like you're really starting to see some of his motifs emerging here. Yeah. But something like that, how bold is that? Just a quick ink sketch, gigantic thick brush, putting it down, you know, getting these ideas together. I'm trying to decide if if uh gandhi is a good guy or a bad guy in his, <laughs> in his strip pretty wild and opportunities coming up to do fill-ins you know and to do like any kind of strips that come up these i believe are advertising work that uh well i guess this is a team be. up with um bill dwyer but no sickles and kniff would do advertising strips as well because again you know you're a young man trying to make your living this is Noel Sickles. Oh, uh, that's cool. This is the early Scorchy Smith. And I thought how good these work as a series. You know, like you're doing these as daily strips, but at the same time, you know, you can almost see like this is the lead into the story. And a lot of these, you know, it's a direct continuation, like from the last panel to the first panel. Yeah. And strange angles. You know, Sickles is a guy for people at home that uh, big influence on Alex Toth. And I think you can see it with some of these very adventurous, man, that overhead angle. Yeah. You're making that up at that time. Right. Man, I love these blow-ups, too, of the original arts. This was one of the strips that he got to do. Single panels, but uh, a daily. <laughs> we should do a modern-day uh, parody of this. What's the strip called? The Gay 30s. Exactly. <laughs> like, just in time for 2030. Bring that back. <laughs> but we could add some stuff to it. It's pretty neat to see him doing the line work. 
Yeah. You know, known for his heavy uh, spotting of blacks and brush inking, but also deft at the tools of the time. And and here we go already. You can see like the Joe Schuster type energy that that uh, they would swipe for uh, his stuff. Yeah, Dickie Dare is something I don't I I forget about that. Yeah, his first go in yeah. a, a comic strip. This video is brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. You can join at three different levels, get early access to our videos to offset the kayfabe effect, and at the King Kayfaber level, you get access to all of our videos early and the recording session live. It is also brought to you by the books that we make. My latest self-published book, True Crime Funnies, is now available on my website, jimrug.com. I am actually having a summer sale offering up some of my past comics that have been unavailable online, including my Blacklight comic, Octobriana 1976, my Wrestling Zine, a collection of wrestling art and covers that I have done over the years, as well as uh, screen prints and out-of-print zines and mini-comics like Rambo 3.5, while supplies last. Ed Piscor's upcoming books include the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. You see the cover proof here. This is going to be a beautiful book. Over 500 pages, including 140 extra pages, plus all of the Hip Hop Family Tree strips. This will be in time for the holidays this year, and it'll be the book of the holidays. There's also an upcoming X-Men Grand Design trilogy collection. All three volumes of X-Men Grand Design coming out later this year from Marvel in one handy volume. These have gone in and out of print, so if you need X-Men Grand Design in your life, and you do, that is the easiest way to pick that one up. Pre-order it now. And Red Room Crypto Killers... Number one, this is the start of the third and final season of Red Room. These are coming out now monthly, so get those on your pool list. Let your comic shop know that you want to subscribe to Crypto Killers. And issue number three, which is coming out next, has a backup featuring a new set of characters that Ed will be working on for the foreseeable future. So could be a uh, great rock key to add to your collection. And now back to our video. This is the sh material. This would go to, like the editorial departments of, of newspapers and stuff as like a promo piece. Like, hey, you're going to want to subscribe to, to uh, the Dickie Dare strip. And a version of this might even be like the placeholder for some days ahead of time before the strip actually shows up. It'll be like, it'll show something like this and be like, in two days, Dickie Dare begins and kind of like get you excited a little bit. Yeah, the, the concept is Dickie Dare, young reader with a great imagination imagines himself in these like classic bits of literature adventure strips and uh it runs for a little while i think it runs for maybe a couple of years fantastic um, that's amazing man. but he would do uh think about the concept of that like in terms of story engine because it's infinite yeah for sure let's do a jack and a beanstalk one let's do where the worlds and you do start to see like the heavy blacks showing up here um but Speaking of that promo art, There's throughout promo his piece. career, he would do new promo art. Whenever it was time for promo pieces, he felt that that would give it a little more juice if it was an original drawing as opposed to like reprinting something out of the strip. True professional. Yeah, and a guy who was doing this when he was super busy and still felt there was value in like, I want them to know this announcement's important. Yeah. Important enough for me to put some new art on it. Now, he he worked his ass off, no yeah. doubt. But but uh, he he had a system, you know, like the best of comic strip artists, they they had their, their studios. And there's some crazy dudes that came through his studio, like fucking Norman Rockwell's kid and stuff. First six, uh, tearing the pirates. Yeah. And you can see it's, it's that early area, a lot of penmanship. This is the first Sunday, very famous yep. one. It's almost Hergé. Yeah, one of the things they said uh, that he that he departed from his editor was when it came to coloring. He was working with these engravers that were just masters, and he said he would challenge them with the color. Yeah. You know, whether it was cool sunsets, you know, the, there's lighting up the sky, stuff like that. That's what you do. So, like, whenever I uh, had my Japanese hip hop family tree deal, and you see the first book, and they're using Japanese characters for uh, sound effects. So that comes back when the first book's out, and I see that, and I'm like, this looks fucking insane. This is so dope. A lot of sound effects in future editions. That's man. pretty Cause, cool. Because I'm just like, I just wanted to see what the Japanese guys do. A Howard Chaykin quote here, talking about uh, Burma. That's This is from uh, probably from his uh, introduction to the Terry and the Pirates yeah. collection number one. That's right. Yeah. Already, so, we're so quick, man. We got the uh, we got the lighting, we got the shadow. That that like, he's he's got these textures that he can build just by daubing, and these are the vestiges. You see this 
in superhero comics, absolutely. Some of the names we could name, just like off the bat, uh, on the latest like um, Alex Toth art stuff on Instagram, you can see Toth like fully inspired by uh, Kniff's work. It goes all the way up to Charles Burns. That's true. And I giant... mean, Kirby cites Kniff. You yeah. know, like, like yeah, it's of course. really the DNA of what, what we look at today. Like, the stuff that's really lasted, a lot of it comes back to Kniff in terms of the, the graphic. Giant brush strokes. Yeah, beautiful. Really ballsy. Yeah, such a nice piece for this. And, you know, you mentioned, like, right away you can see his his style coming through. Think of how many years we looked at work leading up to that. You know, that first published piece, I think, was 1920. So this is a guy who's working a lot between then and the debut of this strip. It's the move, man. And it's you're fired out of a gun. I recommend it. Everybody, man, make daily comics and put them on Instagram. Yeah, you can see some of the coloring. There it is, dude. Like, like, uh, so sharp. And you know, like the real engravers, like the like the real art artisans who have like you know fingers missing on their hands and shit. <laughs> like they see that and they're like, okay, I see what you're doing, Milt. I'm gonna fuck you up on this one, and and, and like and like really go to town. Yeah, I mean, it's stunning. Look at the extreme close up in that on that panel. <laughs> That's a flyer. He he was he was taking a lady out on a date on on when he was working on that strip. You can see him using his assistant, dressing him up for reference. And the secretary here answering mail. Yeah, so much of that. Like, there's a lot of great... And, you know, it's all kayfabe photos and stuff where he's setting up some chick to look like the dragon lady. And and at a certain point, these comic strip guys were making such bank that they were hiring legit Hollywood actresses to be in their studio to, like, dress the part just to stand there. Yeah. You know, they probably lived in that Connecticut house There's and quite shit. a few photos in here as we go. <laughs> um, look at these backgrounds, how incredible these backgrounds are. That's a thing, man. Like... He, you would get that level of background on almost every strip, too. Like, no shorts. Specialty drawing for the Newspaper Guild of New York's war relief effort, 1942. Almost all of this promo art is specialty art. Sure. You know, it's created right for these promos. I, I love his Dragon Lady chick, yeah. man. And and just, like, setting up the That's exactly shots. That's right. yep. Is that Boindage? <laughs> <laughs> Now I gotta look for Boindage, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> the little Terry, man. When he was before pre-war, a lot of Boindage. They talk about whenever they sync up the Sunday strips with the dailies, right? Yeah, that know, was to, a to thing. Tell continuing stories was didn't start that way. Not at all. None of them that comes up. None of them. Watercolors for Christmas cards. It's such a great collection of material and. What a beautiful book, you know, yeah. like by having all these different sources of what we're looking at, it really creates an interesting monograph. I want it for everything, you know, I want it for everything because there's so much, so much like that is lost to history. Like Terry and the Pirates is a, and maybe it's still going on. Like it is a long enduring strip. And to us, it's not, it's kind of nothing like in our, in our lifetimes and shit. Uh, my dad knew Terry and the Pirates, but there were like the TV serials. But it obviously must have made a Promo lot of money. Art. Yeah. So, like, 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 how was that even possible that it made uh, a, a lot of cash? Like, what kind of toys? What kind of, like, all that extra ephemera I'm curious about. I love, I love seeing texture and, and color and paint. These Kniff design dresses were sold at Saks Fifth Avenue. Amazing. So now he's a fashion guy. It's, it's really wild. Like, the color on this stuff, it almost looks photo, photographic yeah, in yeah. some places. Totally. And you look close and it's just watercolor exhibition of, of art in a gallery in new york so you know early getting the uh, comic art up on the wall yeah i love that man and, and it looks like you know like he got he got his stuff back you know it wasn't ballast or used as um insulation at the syndicate they do a nice job here too of like the watercolor mock-up because yeah, we've yeah, seen the, like the reproductions of the printed pages col color guides yes you send that to the engraver that's that's what we were talking about earlier like you send this to them and now they have to figure out how See to get that do. in dots. Yep. With with zipatones and fucking around on the um, plates and stuff. Uh, character studies as well as pencil drawings. It's a great book for all of this. So surprising that he would have any time to do that. Look at that, dude. You got your poppy red sliding into the color. Feels like that's the you know the indicator of what's important. You okay. Know, putting so, a lot of emphasis on that Sunday page. So this is the stuff that I was talking about. Where the, this would be a gray. So check these two out. Same strip. This panel was apparently, uh, had to be redrawn, editorial, wanted it redrawn. He redraws the whole strip from memory because apparently this was sent off mm -hmm. and, you know, got to turn it around. So you'll see like minor variations and look at this guy's head. 
stuck up in the black with his black hair and white outline. Yeah, not ideal. Fix Let's it. fix that. That's that's a that's a dream, right? Because like you're working on this and you're like, okay, if I ever have to do this again, I'll make sure to like put the background back there. Through whatever circumstance was required, like he was able to to fix that, P push out on that a little bit. Yeah, that's amazing. And I bet you, like, the editorial thing is like, Milt, what are you doing? This ain't going to print. Like, I think it's as simple as that. Kniff interview, after one of those characters is killed, it's such a big deal, he has to go on the radio to justify why he was a murderer. Right. <laughs> Imagine having that kind of an impact. I love it. Mm. Famous piece. Famous piece little headshots yeah and extremely patriotic man look at this for coloring <laughs> it's so bold he does blur the line between patriotism and jingoism and as time goes on with like steve canyon uh steve canyon comes out and we're now into like the hippie era at a certain point because he did steve canyon for 20 years before uh vietnam yeah and he was very much like a nixon republican guy and it was creating a lot of fr friction with uh, with the audience because he was very much like, yeah, Vietnam, fuck yeah. Um, but that wasn't, you know, the way things were really ha going This down. is one of those famous strips. And yeah. this was read into con congressional record the following day. Once again, like, imagine that. You know, imagine a comic having that kind of an impact today. Totally. Uh, couldn't could not join up, um, you know, for health issues. Tried to enlist in World War II and was uh, rejected. I forget what that code is. Yeah, but uh, not up to health standards. So trying to figure out, you know, what could he do? And starts doing the uh, the mail call as a GI strip, essentially, as a way to contribute, contribute. something. You know, yeah. keep keep up morale. And uh, Mail Call has been reprinted, and I believe that was an Eclipse collection. So Dean Mullaney, who's putting this book together, publisher of Eclipse back in the uh, in the eighties, we gotta have was, him uh, on, reprinting man. this stuff. And you know, you can see these are the Mail Call strips here. Some of them. I mean, I think it ran like two years, maybe. And it's Mail M A L E. Right. So it's got some sexiness. And some it. of it gets rejected. <laughs> this one has just a no from the approval board. That was too much. That's a funny thing too, because like <laughs> we're going, we're sending these 18 year old boys off to go kill people, but you can't look at some, some titty drawings. Yeah. It's real dumb. I love seeing this stuff too. Like the artwork blown up on a wall. Like you see these dudes, this must be eight or 10 feet tall. Yeah. Wall murals of this Lasciviously art. looking at her, by the way, man, they had bedroom eyes though. All those dudes. Yeah, of course. What is this? This is a Navy insignia. So he designed a bunch of stuff. Like he would get requests from armed forces. You know how they would have like their, their, their platoons and things would have their own kind of insignias designed a bunch of them. So you're going to see some as we flip, flip through. That one was a winner for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, a guy who's really um, putting his time where his mouth is and trying to be, trying to contribute in whatever way he can. How about that for mock-up? Yeah, man. And you see him breaking, like, not just doing his comic strip art as, as we go through this stuff. Yeah, he had a whole system. And I think, like, with these guys, man, I, I, I just think that, like, once you get into that groove, you live there. And you got to create a system of living where everybody's okay with that. Like, like Miss Kniff was a great help I'm sure like like she she knew the score and was like okay man like like uh I just know you're going to be busy for 15 hours a day an armed forces strip and we still ain't even at Steve Canyon that's just right here and and what Steve Canyon is you know he leaves Terry and the Pirates it's an ownership issue yep wants a better stake in the property T Terry and the Pirates owned by the syndicate George Wonder immediately picks that up and uh, Steve Canyon, he had he has ownership in that property, and it goes like what's the year on some of the early ones? Because it it forty seven. I'm gonna look right now. Like I I think it it quits with him, but I think it goes to about eighty eight or something. Yeah, yeah, and quick turnarounds. You know, like whenever he leaves Terry and the Pirates, can't work on Steve Canyon while he's under contract. Can't even do sketches because that would be owned by you right. know, considered owned by the syndicate. So once his contract runs out, it's like get this together, how to have it all in his head, as he says. Right. You know, uh, and that's a kayfabe, obviously, because you can't admit that. 
uh, that you're working on it. Um, so starts January 13th, 47, ends June 4th, 88. So we're looking at almost 40 years of his secondary strip. Yes. The thing that he's known for a second most. But man, if you're going to launch it, how about a Time magazine and a Newsweek cover? Big dude. Yeah. Big promo. <laughs> Here you go, man. Yeah, dude, getting those actress ladies. Get and, you some eye candy. And look at that smile. Look at that smile on his face. <laughs> look at that giant drawing. <laughs> I love this with the whiteout around there. Yeah. I think that's a really striking image. Maybe simple for him, but man, it looks great. These little Gabby Hayes guys that are adorning the uh, Steve Canyon cast. Yeah, creating model sheets for this. Photo references along the way surprised any Asian lady would work with him, man. The shit that he put down in those strips. Much bolder line. This, this is how wild that is for a drawing. This absolutely. is where you start to see like a Charles Burns or somebody totally. responding to some of this stuff. Because this would be considered loose mm -hmm. for, for Kniff when he starts to get into three panel strips. Yeah, for sure. And look at how he's doing white on top of those black lines. So this is the, this is the fascinating thing. He ain't doing that. Like he's probably inking the characters and he's got a full setup. So it's crazy dudes. Like it might be Wayne Boring from Superman comics. Uh, we we know that that um, uh, Dick Rockwell, which sounds like a sentence also or something, uh, a uh, acting star. Absolutely, totally. Uh, w was had a big hand, no pun intended, in uh, <laughs> the late period Steve Canyon strips. So uh, this is a story about how. Gained a reputation during World War II of predicting upcoming actual military offenses. This is in Terry and the Pirates. To the point that um, officials came and visited him right. to figure out what was going on. And it turns out he's just really doing his homework on it. But man, what a wild story. Like, yeah. imagine being somewhat investigated because, like, what you're doing in your comic is kind of accurate to what's coming up in the war effort. It makes you wonder if those guys have come visit, like, hey, you're so patriotic, right? Like, how about, you know, you, you toss a flyer in, into the mixture, man. We know that comics is propaganda is a thing. And look, man, you could draw Steve Cannon in four simple steps. Yeah, that's a classic. <laughs> but uh, Kniff and Canyon story. So it's biography of uh, Kniff, but also in conjunction with what he's doing professionally. What's the year in this stuff? 57. 57. Okay, like in the 80s. Shouts to probably Darren Maurer sent us big boxes of shit, including comics reviews. And there are some late period 1980s Steve Canyon strip reprints in there. And there are sections where it's Steve Canyon reminiscing, but it is totally Milk Kniff doing auto bio using the Steve Canyon strip as a cipher, talking about his musical, pop culture influences, radio, books at the time. It is great. Like it is That's awesome. it is really freaking cool. I think I think you might have a copy of it also. In the Steve Canyon's the checker ones that exist. You see, you notice this stuff right here. We where he draws an extra quarter inch, half inch outside of the um, gutters and shit, depending on the paper size. So that's a fascinating piece. Yeah, it reminds me this this era of like uh, European certain European artists. There's a looseness to this stuff where yeah. it's like the blacks are so bold. You know, you get your heavy lines, you get the spotted blacks, but it's still very much almost gesture. Yeah, if you start looking at this stuff closely, kind of amazing. Man, to work as long as he does, you know, 20, 1920 first published work until, you know, he, basically the end of his Six, life. 65 years. Yeah, 65 years. years. Like, you're going to have these various peaks and almost like multiple mature periods. Totally. Like, it's a lot of work, man. It's, it's, it's you know, every, every single, like, there's a document of every single day of his existence on paper. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'm shooting for with, with my own daily stuff. You know, like, how bold is this for your composition? I, dude, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm in these dudes' heads, right? And like, he had to putty his fucking bathroom that day. So like, <laughs> so like, you just gotta, you gotta get it done, but you gotta kind of like economically figure that out. It's great though, whenever you see like something inventive. Totally. Especially this many years in, you know, yeah. like it's a guy still, still, uh, the wheels are turning. I love it. You can see it on the pages. I love it. It makes me so happy. I'm so glad we're looking at this. Like, look at that. I like, oh man, I hope Miss Kniff. Jane Mansfield. Ex there it is. <laughs> A-listers coming through the studio. Yeah. Just amazing. Still doing model sheets. 
Yeah, it's an incredible body of work. And it's one of those standout comic books. You know, there was a big Kniff biography published, I think maybe a little bit before this book came out. Um, and big, like 900 pages, like a, like a hefty volume biography. But I mean, like, there's so much information contained here. And it's put together so well in this chronological order that you're basically walking through his life, but just doing it through examples of the artwork. And let's face it, we're visual dudes. You know, we're, we're, we're artists. So like this, this uh, says, picture speaks a thousand words. It's so great to see the pencils too. And yeah. look at how much ink he's not putting down. Totally. You know, like the pencil here, there's a lot of spotted blacks and that's not, not making it to the final, uh, final page. Yeah. It's very, talk about gestural. And you can see those newspaper roots, you know, the layouts that he was doing whenever he was part of the dispatch and just kind of the night staff. So did he draw these shits? All these badges are, are from him? This... Yeah, must be. A few of the insignia of outfits. Oh, yeah, I don't know if those are all by him or not. Yeah, it's fair. No, no sweat. So it may have just been promo of uh, the insignias, you know, yeah. keep the morale up. Love these kind of images too. Yeah, like he's the good big at that. Watercolor he's crowds. good at that. It's, it's usually the covers of those Terry and the Pirates. You will see those things reprinted. He and continues then, to do stuff outside of of a daily strip, a very demanding daily strip. You know, like there's a little extra pep in the step of people who went through that Great Depression, and it sticks with you. You know, po poverty is a motivator, and and uh, living through that Great Depression. And prospering during that Great Depression, because it looked like he was working in the 20s. Uh, you, you, you got to keep going. Is that Walter Cronkite? Yeah, for Walter. Good eye. That's amazing. Yeah, so he's got a good audience, you know? Yeah, absolutely. There goes Miss Kniff. Aviation Hall of Fame portraits. See, this kind of stuff... It's such a weird image. It reminds me of like, this is a bygone era of illustration yeah. where like you would get illustrators, but the technique was almost photo, you know, it almost passed as a photo or something, right. you know, from a, from a distance. A lot of, and it makes sense that Shaken would do that, that uh, intro because he showed us uh, when we were off camera, a bunch of, or, or he dropped a lot of names that like when you research them, it's that level of illustration that, that Shaken is down with. Look at this man, guy on the moon. Oh, I can so he, see like little watercolor pieces, you know, putting that art together. So Kniff believes in that then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. 1977, this was a Bruce Lee strip that he and Noel Sickles work on together. Somehow it doesn't go, which is shocking, yeah. but it's still like wild that those guys come together all those years later. So to, that's to your work kayfabe together. name. There you go. Paul Arthur. That's fun. That's just like how Joe Matt's uh, Seth plus Chester Brown equals uh, Joe Matt. Yeah. We'll That's propagate right. That That's myth. right. <laughs> so simple, man. Just a master of black and white. And you know what? You saw those hat, the tricorner hat. Uh, maybe that image was in here somewhere, but in his studio, up uh, on a bookshelf, it's like every single helmet from every army in like World War II, and then there would be like tricorn hats and and uh, just physical reference was very important to those guys. Like, like when you jump in and say, okay, I'm going to do Terry and the Pirates and it's going to be set like this. Now at every antique store you go to and everywhere you go, you're just accumulating that reference because it's a little bit daunting to go to the reference library of, you know, so-and-so Connecticut or something every two days or something. Yeah, like right. you got to, you got to do that work yourself. He really looked like Martin Landau as, um, Bela Lugosi in his, in his, uh, final days. Karloff? Sidekick? Fuck you! Dick Rockwell. There he is, man. <laughs> Sheldorf. Yeah, amazing. Great book. Kirby, right? Big there time. it is. There it is right there. Yeah, big time. Wow. Because, like, look, that's 47, 48. Kirby was in the game, but he was never drawing Kirby hands. Wow, that's wild. That's so exactly that giant Kirby fist that we've all uh, all recognized. Yeah, man. So the Great American Comics, this is the IDW published line that Mulaney, I guess, oversees, editor, whatever it would be. These are some great books. This is one of those things that, like, we're lucky to have this. Absolutely. So much good material. Um, what an heck episode. of a book, man. 
This is uh, something we've been wanting to talk about for a while. I think it's probably pretty clear to everybody that just watched this, the reason why. And if by some chance you're not familiar with Kniff, you have no excuse now. Like, go out and study this man's work. Because we know you clicked the video with that, uh, with that uh, lascivious title. <laughs> <laughs> Good to go? Yeah. Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Cartoonist Kayfabe comic book Christmas in July is rapidly approaching. We've got about four weeks to go, man. And what that is, last Saturday, July, we're taking a bunch of our comics and we are dumping them into those free little lending libraries in our neighborhoods. You drive by uh, different streets and you see those things uh, pop popping up. Put some comics in there. We need to generate new comic book readership. And you know, the people that visit those things probably read. Uh, so that's our effort to increase comic book readership. Uh, we have a Patreon here at uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe, and uh, the King Kayfabers are watching us stream these videos as we record them, and they're getting all of the final videos delivered to them uh, before anybody else completely mitigates the Kayfabe effect. Um, videos are brought to you by the books that we make, and uh, coming up, man, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is going to come out in October. This is my collection of the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree plus 140 pages of additional stuff that is not in those four volumes. You're going to need this, man. This is the ultimate statement. Uh, it's coming out in October. Gives you plenty of time to get an extra copy for that hip hop fan in, in uh, your life. They might know the records, but they might not know the comic, and this is made for them. X-Men Grand Design Trilogy is another holiday effort that is coming out. Uh, it is collecting my three X-Men Grand Design Treasury Editions, and some of that stuff is out of print. So it's your chance to get it all in one stop. And, X and Red Room Crypto Killers is the latest comic that is coming out. Uh, here's the cover for Red Room Crypto Killers number one. Uh, issue 2 should be out anytime now, and uh, I encourage you to grab Red Room Crypto Killers issue number 3 because that will be considered a hot key in the Ed Piscor bibliography. Um, the reason for that is that uh, there is a backup story in there, and those characters are going to be the main subject of this daily strip that I'm going to be working on for the foreseeable future. It's going to have book collections and things, but their first appearance is Red Room Crypto Killers 3. Jimmy, what do you have? My latest book, True Crime Funny, self-published, just debuted last weekend at Heroes Con, and I have been getting a lot of messages asking how people can get this. Well, I am selling that on my website starting June 24th, Saturday. You can join me there, first come, first serve, and I am also doing a big summer sale there, so it won't just be True Crime Funnies, but a lot of the books that I've done over the last couple of years that I haven't had online for sale, such as Octobriana 1976. This is my Blacklight comic from a couple of years ago. Limited quantities of these still available. I'll be posting on my website as well, starting on Saturday, along with zines, things like this wrestling zine, collecting some of my wrestling artwork from over the last several years. Uh, Rambo 3.5 will be reprinted and available there. Some of my out-of-print books like Aphrodisiac, a little bit of everything, but limited quantities. So get there first uh, on Saturday, June 24th, and while supplies last, load up on the Jim Rug books that are missing from your collection. You can also join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can see my latest comics and art. Name a couple other ways that people can support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, Jimmy. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, fanny packs, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All great ways to support the channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.